Welcome to the Daniel Bryan. Welcome to the Daily Thank Show. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here. Yeah, nice to be here in person. I know. Right? I Last like time we that. spoke was virtually, and, and now we are here. And you are here with, honestly, one of the most fascinating accounts of a life that I feel everybody thinks they know knows about, and yet nobody does. Rosa Parks. If you told me I'm going to make a documentary film about Rosa Parks, I'd go, why? There are so many of them. There's never been a documentary about Rosa Parks. How Rosa is that Park. possible? Because everybody thinks they know the story of Rosa Parks, but actually what you know is mostly not accurate, and there's so much that you don't know. So it's a, she's an absolutely fascinating topic for a doc. Well, I'll say this. Before I watched the documentary, and, you know, maybe until a few years ago, I would have always said the story of Rosa Parks is the story of this old lady who was a black woman, and she got onto a bus, and they told her that she had to sit at the back of the bus, and she said no, and she sat at the front, and then her, you know, momentary uh, moment of rebellion... Day and a half, sparked, max. Yeah, <laughs> day and a half sparked this entire civil rights conversation in and around America. She was 42 years old when that happened, and, in fact, she wasn't at the front of the bus. She was in the middle of the bus, a section for black people, that when a white person decided to sit there, the black people had to get up because white people didn't want to sit next to black people wow. in the middle of the bus. And so on that day, she decided no. The way the story goes was she was tired. And when she would tell that story later, she'd say, you know, I tell people that I was tired and I was no more tired than any other workday, but I was tired of being pushed around. When she died, the New York Times described her as the accidental matriarch, but her life story was absolutely not accidental at all. It seems like she was not only calculated but she was focused and purposeful in everything that she did. For everything. instance, she was an active member of the NAACP. She was actively engaging in civil rights and mobilizing people. And, and this documentary, I think, talks about Rosa Parks, but it talks about a larger issue that we have in how we shape narratives, in that a lot of the time, women have been erased from the work that they have done in countless movements, not just in America, but around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think especially in the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks... And again, I never thought about what happened after the Montgomery bus boycott, right? She, sit, she sits on the bus, there's a boycott, it ends, yeah. everybody goes back to normal. Well, no, Rosa Parks is never able to work again. And even wow. as civil rights legend in her own community, she had to move to Detroit. That was part of her reason for moving to Detroit. Her husband, never able to work again. I had no idea. She never was able to leverage a lot of the money that civil rights leaders were able to do speaking around the country, around the globe. She had no access to any of that and absolutely desperately in need of money. I mean, it was so interesting to me to see how wrong we all have been about Rosa Parks. She was an activist for decades, decade after decade after. Right. I mean, she, she was a fan of, of Dr. King and a big fan of Malcolm X. She w worked with the Black Panthers, like Rosa Parks. You see, you don't, you don't, you don't Who realize knew? this, yeah, until yeah. you watch a documentary like this and you see the story being told. Do you think, in, in a case like this, it is actively people trying to push Rosa Parks out of a narrative, or is it just unfortunately a byproduct of a world that's focused on the men who are doing the same thing that the women are? I think it's a little bit of both. So I think, I think when you get to write the narrative, then the men will star in the narrative. It's mm -hmm. their story, and they'll tell it. But I also think, I mean, Dorothy Height was one of the founders of the, the, the March on Washington, did not get to speak at all. But there she was, mm -hmm. the, one of the organizers. So I, I think part of it is that, just not allowed to kind of be part of that story. But I'm always interested in, why are we so comfortable with this uh, accidental civil rights leader? When she literally, from the time she was a child, yeah. she was mad about how white children were able to have buses and go to school and better schools than she was able to go to. Like, she knew it from the time she was a little kid. There was absolutely nothing that was accidental about her. So why do we feel so comfortable with this lesson of it was just soft and easy and comfortable, and then one day there was this thing, and then she said, and then it mm -hmm. ended, and the, the end. Do, do, you think, do you think that sometimes it's because people like to hear about a story that seems to happen organically, because oftentimes movements may fall under the weight of somebody's idea of how planned or calculated they were. Because when, when you look at all civil rights leaders around the world, you know, whether it's Martin Luther King Jr., whether it's Malcolm X, whether it's Nelson Mandela, whoever it is, Winnie Mandela, who, whoever it is, anywhere you go, you find that they were a lot more planned and calculated in fighting for people's liberation than they were given the credit for at times. And so do you, do you ever wonder if it's a... Um, if it's 
almost what society wants. I think it's a better narrative. I think it's more interesting to right. be accidental uh, when she clearly was not. I also think the work of civil rights, whether it is Nelson Mandela or anyone, is a slog. It literally is almost a boring story. It is. Day after day, year after year, decade after decade, you took two steps forward and sometimes three steps back, mm -hmm. but sometimes one step back, right? Like that's really the story. And I kind of like that story because I think people should have an honest sense of how it actually works, that mm. not one day someone accidentally stumbles upon being the matriarch of the civil rights. Like, that's insane. That. It makes no sense, right? Of course it's planning. Of course it's strategy. Of course it's intentional. I think we undermine all the work that went into the civil rights movement by pretending that somehow a handful of people stumbled together. During the bus boycott, it is amazing to me that teachers sent home notes with little children saying, on Monday, tell your parents, do not put you on the bus. No one told anyone. Wow. The secret did not get out. It was a complete surprise. I mean, how organized by women and calculated does that have to be that not one kid mentioned to anybody like there's going to be a boycott on Monday? I think that is insane that's, and important that's pretty genius. and impressive. Yeah. So why not know the real story and why bother with this fake story? It, it is genius. Also, because if you give a kid a note to take home to their mom... <laughs> Might not get there. They, they don't want to talk at all. So they're just like, oh, they told me to give you this note, mom. And it's like, is it about me? No, no, we good? Oh, good luck. Thank you. Um, I, I, I really loved watching this because I Thank think it, it tells a story that needs to be told. And I think it encourages people, in, if you ask me. Because to what you're saying about building and growing, I think we do live in a society where people think that change happens overnight. And when you see how long the slog is and when you see the results from that time that gets put in, I think it maybe sometimes becomes inspiring to know that that change it can take a long effect. Time, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you so Wonderful much. Wonderful seeing you again. <laughs>